Good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Holmstrom, and uh, I'm a friend of Dave's. And on behalf of the Anglican family, I want to welcome you to this memorial and celebration of the life of James Carl Engelkin, or as his family and friends know him as Jim. Um, I'm going to start out. I'm going to start out with an opening prayer, and then uh, the, uh, the service will proceed from there. So please bow with me. We come to you, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to comfort the Anglican family in this time of mourning for the passing of Jim, an incredible husband to Dieta, a loving father to Dave, Daniel, and Donna, an awesome grandfather, and an inspiration to the students he taught, and a great friend. But Father, we are here today to reflect upon and honor Jim's life and the so many people he helped and inspired so we can take forward his memory and the example he, prov he provided for us to follow. I thank you, Father. Please bless this time. I pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to have Dave come up and um, introduce this next uh, song. He's got, there's a little bit of background behind it. So come on up, Dave. Thanks, Eric. I'm uh, Jim's oldest son, David, and uh, after Dad passed from the hospital um, over at Donna Staley's house, all of a sudden I heard some singing in the living room, and they were practicing a song for Dad in his honor that we wanted to play here. And uh, Sherry and Natty and Brittany and Sabina, I mean, um, Shannon. Sabina didn't say, sorry, Sabina. Um, and Heather Jones all have wonderful voices. And we put together this song, or they put together this song, I recorded it. And uh, we couldn't sing it up here, but we're gonna listen to it. And, and it's called Grandpa, Tell Me About the Good Old Days. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. And Carl Engelkin played wonderful guitar. Thank you.
just saw some smiles out there. That was awesome. <laughs> um, next, we're going to have uh, some, of the, some of the family come up and share um, about Jim. And uh, I think, Daniel, you're, you're up, my friend. Thank you. Morning. <clears throat> uh, family, friends, and shipmates, thank you for taking the time to come here today as we celebrate the life of my father, a husband, grandfather, friend, and shipmate. <clears throat> so I'll begin at the beginning. Dad was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and after a few years, the family moved to a town, St. Clair, Missouri, population 1,400. I didn't begin to understand the life he had growing up until the family traveled back to Missouri in 1979 after he retired from the Navy. In my youth, he talked about Indian Creek, Merrimack and Burbis Rivers, Old Iron Bridge, a house on K Road and Shady Street, and a Piney Bluff Elementary, the one-room schoolhouse he attended, so I was intrigued. He took us by the house on Shady Street, maybe it was K Road, and I asked him, does that look like the house that you grew up in, Dad? And he answered, yes, except for uh, this house has a new roof and we had a tin roof. And the siding was new and we had bare walls and no insulation. And I'm sure they have indoor plumbing where we had an outhouse and a hand pump in the kitchen. So when my dad started high school, he lived in a thousand square foot home with his two grandparents, his mom's dad, his brother Skeeter and sister Charlene. I asked him, where'd you sleep? He said he, uh, he, said he slept on the couch. I said, where'd you take a bath? He said, well, we heated up water on the stove and bought a wash tub in the kitchen. And that's why I liked high school so much because I could go in early and have a janitor let me in and I can get a shower. And I said, then what'd you do? And he said, well, I'd usually study. <clears throat> Graduating as a valedictorian of the class of 1955 and not having enough money to go to college with the draft looming, he decided at 17 years old to join the Navy and become a radio man. He met my mother and they married in 1959 and shortly after they moved to Oahu in Hawaii. My brother Dave was born in 1961 and the very next day he was applied to and accepted by the Navy's NESEP program. And I can picture my dad getting home after seeing the birth of his first son, making a pot of coffee, lighting up a Pall Mall, sitting at the kitchen table, thinking he has to do more because now he's a family man with even greater responsibilities. Shortly after I was born, we moved to Columbia, Missouri, where he earned his degree in electrical engineering, and then to San Diego, where we lived on housing in Herbert Street. My earliest memories of with dad are flying a car kite and riding bikes to the milk store, and this is where I got my first course of doing things the right way. By coming down a hill, I break the bike with my feet. And dad promptly told me to turn the bike around and go back home, and I was not to ride that bike until I learned how to do it properly. You know, a father has many things to teach his son, and dad never wavers from his ideology, regardless of time or fads. You can tell he was out to sea by the length of Dave and mine's haircuts. And when he returned from Westpac, the next day it was like, okay, you two, muster in the garage, you're getting haircuts. He was not the best barber, at least the hair would grow back. From Herbert Street, we moved to the Philippines, living in Cavite City in a home without potable drinking water and sleeping under mosquito nets, and it was heaven. <clears throat> when we moved on base six months after arriving, we lived in a house about 20 yards from the water, and Dad would get off work from down the street, and he'd come home with a bag of shrimp and a fishing poles in hand. We'd go out to the pier and we would fish. Um, you know, it, just, it doesn't get much better than spending that kind of time with your father fishing on a pier in the Philippines. From the Philippines, we moved back to San Diego, and shortly he was sent to Vietnam. I would pray every day for a safe return from the war, and when he did, he always bought us swag from overseas. Tasting cream, kimchi, and drinking Vietnamese tea, getting patches from various military units, getting black berets with his unit insignia on it, it was like Christmas. I love when his ships would come in from overseas tour and going down the dock and the smell of the waters and the ships and the anticipation of trying to be the first one to spot him up on that ship and then the next day in the garage for a haircut. <laughs> we lived an idyllic life and by the time I was in fifth grade we went from San Diego to Missouri, from Missouri to San Diego, from San Diego to the Philippines, Philippines to San Diego, San Diego to Rhode Island, back to San Diego. <laughs> All because my dad, with tremendous support from my mom, sat down at a table in Hawaii and decided he was going to do better for his family. He had tremendous love for his family and when he retired from the Navy in 1979, 
We were aboard the USS Chicago for the ceremony. I remember him speaking about his time in the Navy and finishing his speech, he pointed to us and he said, here's the most important thing in my life, my family. We were at mom and dad's 50 year wedding anniversary in Branson, Missouri. My cousin Charles and Carl were there and Charles came up to me and said, I love your dad. And I almost had a weird look on my face and he continued, he said, no, no, you don't understand. Your dad would do anything for us. There were times when I would call him from the base because I needed a ride. It don't matter what time it was and what he was doing, he would hop in his truck and he would come down and get me. When Dave recorded him after the Christmas of 2015 and asked him the most important thing in his life was, he immediately answered, family. He was a genealogist. He was given a Bible in his youth and in that Bible there was a family tree and he was able to get past his, he was unable to get past his grandfather. And so when he finally retired, he committed himself to research and discovered many things about the family. A relative that was a pallbearer at George Washington's funeral, an uncle that had fought in the Civil War. He was able to research the family uh, name back to 1504. He wanted to know where he came from and he wanted to ensure that future generations knew this as well. He loved music. Two kinds of music in particular, country and western. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the whole story. He listened to everything from American folk music to classical to rock and roll to Spike Jones. And I'm not talking about the Spike Jones, the young Spike Jones. I'm talking about Spike Jones and his wacky, wacky cans, but that's a long story. Um, his Jimmy Rogers albums was my inspiration to learn how to play the guitar. Dad can do anything he set his mind to, and when we moved to the house on Warhurst Street, we built a block wall in the back, we put up a patio cover, he built cabinets in the game room, we laid down carpet, carpet, and he taught me how to build a rabbit trap. I sleep in a four-poster bed with Sabina's blanket chest at the foot of my bed because I had the confidence, in not just carpentry, but the things that we were doing, and Dad saying, you can do that, with that can-do attitude. This can-do attitude courses through the veins of his grandchildren. A successful businesswoman, one an eleven and a half million dollar operation, a doctor and a lieutenant in the Navy, a val another valedictorian student, college student, an engineer finishing up her last year at college, another valedictorian going to be a math professor, a college student going to be a teacher, a martial artist going to college and going in the military, wants to be a policewoman, and the last one wants to play football in college and be a doctor. He will be watching over his grandchildren and he will be beaming. He loved to read. There wasn't a time where I didn't see him without a book, and he had every Louis L'Amour book written. He enjoyed Alistair McLean, Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, and I stumbled on a novel, uh, a novelist named W.E.B. Griffith, and his novels, The Court. I loved to talk to Dad and talk about the book and the author, and he ignited my interest in reading because he was never without a paperback. He was an expert marksman, and as in, in his youth, he outshot the men at a country fair and won a ham, but it didn't stop there. He was feared by many a snail in the garden. He would go out in the misty San Diego mornings with his trusty BB gun and dispatch many a marauding snail. And unfortunately, the state of California banned snail hunting and he had to hang up his guns. <laughs> Dad loved to talk politics and it was cool to ask his opinion about politics and politicians and even ask about the events and get a military man's perspective. I love to... Uh, Sometimes hear him or tell him that I was going to vote for Ralph Nader just to get a rise out of him. <clears throat> but you would be uh, well prepared to discuss, compare, and, uh, and, and uh, contrast, and expand upon your position, or it would be no match. I love to listen to him tell sea stories. He could put you in the middle of the Indian Ocean with green water breaking over the bow of the ship and the surface search radar breaking free from the mast and going overboard, and you were right there. Bowling, ping pong, and pinochle. He was a very good bowler and loved the sport. He and mom took many a first place trophy at the various duty stations they were stationed at. He was an exceptional ping pong player and a, and a fleet champ. And when the family came up to Reno in 2004, I set up my ping pong table in the garage thinking at last I'm gonna beat him because I never beat him. <clears throat> He's in his late sixth season. We're at altitude, right? Wasn't even close. I don't even think he broke a sweat. Now to pinochle. When Sabina and I would plan a trip to San Diego, the first thing on our list to do was get in as many pinochle games as we could. Drinking coffee and playing Navy double deck pinochle and listening to Sabina ask Dad what Trump was and my father responding three bumps was hysterical. Now Dad would keep scoring. From time to time he would announce a score that was obviously wrong to see he was paying attention and Sabina mom would always catch him 
and his mischievousness would send him into fits of laughter. He was a tremendous figure of authority. Dad had two rules to live by. One, no lying. And number two, you don't do anything you know you're not supposed to do, or as he would say, direct disobedience of lawful orders. He commanded and demanded respect, and growing up, if you didn't give it to him, he was fearsome. He was the oracle of wisdom. He didn't necessarily give you advice on what to do, but he would always help you understand your position so you can make great choices. He would say, life is tough. It's tougher if you're stupid. <laughs> make good choices and don't sweat, sweat the small stuff and keep on trucking. Dad won't be known to the world as Einstein or Van Gogh or Flake Roy Wright, but to us, he was equally great. He was the oracle of wisdom. And why we will miss him terribly, he leaves upon, behind a masterpiece of memories that we will all enjoy and revel in. To quote his pulmonologist, he was brilliant. Now in the naval tradition, as we bid farewell to his final resting spot, I'm inspired to say, single up all lines and prepare to get underway. We wish you fair winds and following seas. I love you, Dad. We're going to do a sound test because anybody who knows me knows how loud I am and I don't want to blow you guys out. So is that good? All right. For those who don't know me, I am Sabina. I am married to Daniel, mother of Shannon, Heather, Natalia, and Kyle. I looked back and tried to remember the first time I met Jim in 1993, rattled my mind, and nothing. I was frustrated at first and then realized that I do not remember because from the beginning, Jim made me feel like I belonged, like family. Coming from a less functional upbringing, I always had a lot of envy for my husband's beaver cleaver childhood. But as much envy as I had, that is how much gratitude I had that God gave me the Inglekins. When I visited Jim, I'm sorry, when I visited San Diego, Jim and I used to be the first ones up every morning. We would talk about anything and everything. I was privileged to hear his naval stories, his way of life growing up, about David, Daniel, and Donna's childhood, and how they did drive him crazy sometimes. He would then spend about an hour listening to all my stories. This went on for years. I was able to visit almost monthly when the kids were little, I did that because I really wanted the kids to have a strong male role model besides their father, and selfishly to get my family time with my in-laws. I never had someone I could use the title dad with. At times, I was resentful, but yet not having that made me a strong and self-sufficient woman. In my 20s, I came to peace with being fatherless. Then came Jim. He gave me unconditional love, a firm talking to when needed, a feeling of support that was always there, and finally that person to look up to, that person I would aspire to be. I could have gone on many different paths in my life. I was, a, I was fortunate enough to be given a chance to see what life can be and should be by the example of Jim and Dieta. Shannon, you are the beginning of the grandchildren empire your grandfather was privileged to have. Heather, lieutenant in the Navy, naval doctor. Grandpa was a very proud papa. Kyle and Heather, Avery Charlotte will now get an additional guardian angel to her army. Natalia, when you were just a little tot, Grandpa would always boast to me how mature you were. You would have the deepest conversations with him. Then you grew up, let him know you registered as a Democrat, and he still loved you. <laughs> Kyle James Engelkin, big name, but you are like your father, which in turn makes you very much like your grandfather. Carry that name proudly. Daniel, find peace in your heart that you are your father's son. Your dad would light up as soon as you turned on your inquisition of all his naval stories. The similarities between you and Jim are pound to full, but let me name a few. 
your taste in music, Hank Williams and Ernest Tubbs, your grammar, Icebox and Skivvies, and yes, your sneaky way of winning at Pinnacle all the time. I could spend days on how James Engel can impact in my life as well as my children's, but I will end with a poem. You can shed tears that he is gone, or you can smile because he has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he comes back, or you can open your eyes and see all he has left. You can be empty because you can't see him, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember him and only that he is gone, or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back, or you can do what he wanted, smile, open your eyes, love your family, and keep on trunk trucking. Thank you, Jim. I will forever miss you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Staley Myers. Uh, I am Jim's son-in-law, married to Donna. But being a son-in-law was like being Jim's son. He was like a father to me. He treated me like everybody else with respect. When my wife was pregnant eight months with her first daughter, uh, Jim took me back to his hometown of Sinclair, Missouri. Can you imagine that? He wanted me to meet his best friend, Harold Hawkins, and he wanted me to go fishing with him on the Merrimack River, his new son-in-law. I'll never forget that. He knew he had to do this because our lives were gonna start getting busy and there just wouldn't be that chance except for right then to grab me and take me back there. Who does that? Jim does that. Jim's giving didn't stop there with his family. He opened his home to so many of us uh, who needed a place to stay at a time. Some of you are here in the audience today who he opened his home to and just Stay with us while you figure out what you're doing. Jim had a way of helping his family when it was in need. He figured out a way to impact them in a, in a positive way that, that would make their outcome good. He never asked for anything except for you to be successful. That's all he wanted. Jim was a lieutenant commander in the Navy, and he served 24 years there. He worked in the private sector at Trey Corps for 10 years, but I believe his favorite work was as, as a teacher at Palm Desert High School. His passion for teaching young people and seeing them succeed was his reward. Jim was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a shipmate, a friend, and a teacher, but most of all, Jim was a great example on how to live life. I want to thank everybody here for honoring my dad. It means a lot to the family. My mom's been a rock through this time. I love you, Mom. I'm David Engelkin. I'm Jim's oldest son. And um, this is one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life um, because I love my dad and I miss him. But this is one of the easiest things I've had to do in my life too because my, I love my dad and it's easy to talk about dad's character. Dad was the most influential man in my life. He was a humble man. He had incredible wisdom. Uh, I would call him weekly to call mom, you know, living in Colorado just to keep in touch and just, just talk about all kinds of things. Talk about life, how are the kids doing, how is Brittany, how is Sean doing. And, and dad would uh, always have words of wisdom and to the point where, why didn't I think of that? And I mean, it got to the point later in life I thought my dad would be a great president one day because he just, he's got some common sense. And I don't know what his IQ was. Uh, you know, he graduated valedictorian. Uh, there's a scripture 
about Jesus that said the people were amazed at Jesus because he did everything well. And uh, my dad didn't walk on water. You know, he, he wasn't Jesus. But he did everything well. In raising the family, we knew that he had unconditional love for us. Um, excellent discipline. Um, you know, he wasn't your typical military guy. I hope we don't come across like he was forceful. He did, he disciplined us, spanked us in a loving way. <laughs> when we need it, it works. It works. But let me share one story about that. Um, and I, I don't want to, you know, my dad would say, I didn't spank you guys that much. And he did, but uh, you kind of remember those things. But one time, he, uh, he spanked me because I did something wrong, and he thought he was so sure I did something wrong. And uh, he found out that Dan was the one who did it. <laughs> and I'm in the bathroom, and Dad walks up, and he's got the belt in his hand, and he says, spank me. Because he, was so, he felt so bad that he had spanked me for something I didn't do. And, um, you know, things like that, I wasn't going to spank my dad. <laughs> uh, he, uh, that was enough, you know. I knew, he knew, and... We were so close, and it didn't matter at that point. Uh, we had a rump, wonderful, stable family. Um, and my dad was a rock uh, to so many of you, and it brought me great joy how he helped a lot of people. There's a scripture in Philippians 2 that reminds me a lot about my dad. 2 3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And a lot of us are here because my dad had an interest in everybody here. Uh, you know, he was a, kind of a good old boy from Missouri, but he also was a city slicker from San Diego. And uh, he loved to help people. Uh, he was kind of that quiet giant. He, did, he wouldn't talk about it. He'd just do it. Um, and a lot of us are here because of his influence and how he's helped so many family members to have stability. Uh, some of the warm memories I have as far as his naval career is coming back from the sea and being at the Navy Pier and just looking at the, uh, all the guys in white, all the sailors and the uh, officers on the ship and trying to find Dad. Oh, there's Dad, you know, and, and just getting so excited that my dad's back in town because you really missed him. You know, having the, the sign, welcome home, Dad, you know, it was just exciting times as a kid. And then um, when we moved to the Philippines, I was, you see, we were there when we were seven to nine years old. Dan was 68 years old. The military didn't have housing initially, and so we lived off the military base for about six months, where they burned trash across the street, and we were bused to school. So you've got two kids from the United States, they're not used to this foreign country. And um, the first day of school, we were dropped off at the cemetery. And then we were walking to find our, our house, and we got lost. Now, when you're a six-year-old and a seven-year-old, two toys in the Philippine Islands, you kind of stand out. And um, I just remember thinking, Dan, we'll find, we'll get, we'll get out of here, you know. And so we're, we're walking around, looking around, and, you know, imagine. It kind of reminds me of, the, if you know the parable of the prodigal son, you ever felt like being lost? When you're in a foreign country, you don't know anybody, you are lost. Well, what happened was, we were walking down uh, the, uh, this road, and this Filipino man was in his garage. And he saw Dan and I, and he said, uh, are you guys uh, okay? Are you lost? And, and bottom line, he had a military sticker, and he drove us on base, and my dad was there to greet us. And, I tell you, just to see Dad, it was just so, so awesome. Um, yeah, the great memories. I mean, my dad, you know, we mentioned how he was a valedictorian. He got his MBA. He did well as an officer. One time when I was in his office, he just had all these piles of, of uh, letters from students. And uh, here's when he was a teacher at Palm Desert High School for 10 years. Uh, the students gave him this... Uh, Thing, words of wisdom, what he would do would put a quote every day on, on the chalkboard, and uh, students just loved it, but he taught honors math, and a lot of people, you know, I started reading these letters and cards, I just started 
tearing up because this is my dad. I love to hear what people thought about him because I knew what he, what he was like. You know, he was a, a great example and great influence on a lot of people. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to comment on is uh, who here has had a picture taken by my dad? <laughs> okay. Uh, his middle name could have been paparazzi. Um, I, mean, I was working on the slideshow for the reception today, and if it wasn't for Dad's pictures, I don't know if I'd have material, but just kidding. Um, but Dad, uh, you know, we'd be sitting in Mom and, Mom and Dad's family room, and a bunch of us as, you know, family members sitting around just talking, and Dad would be sitting on the chair going like this. And, uh, and then, you know, Dad, why are you taking pictures? We're eating, you know? Or, and uh, he, uh, he would say, well, you might not like it now, but later on you will. And now we can look at back at his pictures that he took. We can all say we're grateful that Dad took pictures because it's, you know, it's great to have memories. And uh, I'll never forget who he was. Um, I, think, uh, I think you all know that Dad has COPD and he smoked for many years. And you know, back then when education wasn't that great, I know he, he said he wished he would have never smoked. He quit many, many years ago, and he had a regimen of doing the treadmill uh, for four or five days a week, and I know that that allowed him to live longer. But uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of how f the family pulled together when Dad was at Sharp Hospital. And, um, you know, when Friday I, I, I uh, called him up and he said he wasn't feeling very well, and um, I, I didn't want him to talk. He sounded kind of distant. He had a mask on for, for oxygen. And uh, this, then he went to the hospital that day. And, and Monday, a lot of us flew in, and we gathered around the bed. And uh, I was so grateful that my daughter, Brittany, could make it the next morning, that morning, the Tuesday morning, uh, to, be, to be with Dad. So there's about 14 of us, siblings and spouses. And we all got together and gathered around Dad and, we, you know, it, it, he was, his body was too far gone. Uh, but the, the thing that I want to share with you, that he was in peace. Uh, he had no pain. Um, they did an excellent job. And it made it easier to uh, understand, you know, the whole uh, finality of what was about to happen. And that Dad, we wanted Dad to make sure that he was not in pain. And he, he uh, passed peacefully. But before he passed, we all gathered around and held hands, and I said a prayer to God, and said, you know, Father, I commit my father, my dad to you, and he's in your loving arms. And um, then 30 minutes after that, he passed calmly and peacefully, and he always said, don't put me in a whole old folks home. <laughs> he also said uh, he didn't want to, you know, be put on a ventilator. So. You know, he got his wish. He died with family surrounding him that loved him peacefully. And that's all we can ask. Nobody, nobody wants to die. And uh, I miss my dad. But I'm thankful that the way he passed was peacefully surrounded by loved ones. Um, I want to end by uh, sharing a letter that my dad wrote in 1999 to David and myself. Uh, Donna and Daniel. In 1999, it was their, my mom and dad's 50th, or I should say 40th anniversary. We got them a limo. We went to Benihana's. And uh, I put together a slideshow. You see a slideshow. They're peeking out the, the top of the, the limo. And they were so in love and, and just a wonderful time. And uh, I want to end because these are the words of dad and what he expressed to us. And it will really tell you what was important. In his life. So after that wonderful time, on May 17th, 1999, this is what Dad wrote. Dear children and spouses, last night was so overwhelming for me that I didn't say very much. But I want to let you know how much, how very much I appreciated what you all did. The love Mom and I felt was beyond what words can express. I thought about this as I drove to the desert today and decided to drop you a note. The past 40 years have been really amazing. We have been a lot of places and done a lot of things. Probably the most amazing thing has been my incredible luck in loving and being loved 
by the most unselfish, caring woman in the world. Not only that, but she's good looking too. <laughs> My dad got that right. The months I spent overseas, and even the year that I was gone, found her to be a pillar of strength. Especially when you got two teenage boys going after each other. No, it wasn't that bad. She supported me no matter what path I wanted to take, including giving up a high-paying job to be a teacher. I don't always express my feelings, probably because I don't do it very well and tend to get a little emotional. But we consider ourselves truly blessed to have such a fine family. A year ago, when I took a course in management, one of our projects was to present a speech defining success in life. At that time, I said something to the effect that I would consider my life as having been a success if as I grew older and my children had become adults, I could look at my children and be proud to say they are my children. It has nothing to do with financial success, awards won, or any materialistic things. It has only to do with personal integrity and the people they have become. My life has been abundantly successful. Thanks, love, Dad. And I just want to end in saying, he would say the same thing about all the grandkids. This was, you know, a long time ago, 16 years ago. And that's how he felt. He, he loved us dearly, and I want to end with my dad's words. Thank you. Uh, Chad Thompson is going to sing for us right now. He raised me up. Thank you, Chad.
to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shore. to more than I can be. You raise me up to more than I can be. I gotta follow that. <laughs> no fair. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, say a few words. Um, the uh, at a time like this, uh, one of the scriptures that you know it comes to mind. It comes out of the book of Ecclesiastes in uh, chapter three, and. It, Ecclesiastes it was written by Solomon, and he is allegedly the wisest man that ever lived. And um, so I'm going to read some of this. The interesting thing, too, is that this has been put into a song, you know, like turn, turn, turn. You've heard this. Uh, it was written by Pete Seeger, and uh, the birds sang it back in the day. And it goes something like this There's a time for everything and every season for every activity under, under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from the toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. You know, Solomon wrote this near the end of his life. Um, when he was a young man, it, it says in 1 Kings that, you know, Solomon was about to become king after David uh, passed away. And he said, um, in his prayer, he prays, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern, govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased with Solomon because of what Solomon's request was centered on. I'll give you a wise and discerning heart. Moreover, I will give you both wealth and honor. You see, Solomon was, you know, he, he didn't ask for riches for himself. He wanted to be wise so he could lead people. And, you know, that's, there's a selflessness in that. And, um, and, and the impression I get from meeting D and, and the family and knowing Dave is that Jim was also selfless and extremely wise. You know, uh, we heard about his career. Actually, he had three careers. <laughs> um, he had his Navy career, and, and it didn't start out easy. It, it said he, you know, he, went, he enlisted in the Navy because he didn't have enough money to go to school, but he was the val valedictorian of his class, so he, obviously he was smart. So he starts out as an enlisted man, and, and then he advanced rapidly in his rate, 
And then he was selected to go into the Navy Enlisted Scientific Education Program, NESEP. And that's extremely competitive. I was in the Navy, and I, I know that. And, uh, and so after completing, going through uh, his studies at the, in um, Missouri, he, he gets a degree in electrical engineering. He goes on to OCS and receives his commission in 1966. Oh, by the way, just in time for Vietnam, where he served with distinction. If you, if you read um, you know, an account, you can see all the medals and stuff that he, he, uh, he, he won there. He, he, Jim retires from the Navy in 1979 at the rank of Lieutenant Commander. But then, then he goes on and has two 10-year careers. It's interesting. He's, Jim was a program manager for Traker and then became a high school math teacher? That's amazing to me at Palm Desert High School from 1989 to 99. You know, it's interesting. He pursued education for himself, earning a bachelor's of science in electrical engineering and then an MBA while still in the Navy. But then he goes on and becomes not just, he, he, was, the, he, he was educated, then he becomes an educator, which is just amazing to me. And, uh, you know, he was a high school math teacher he gave of himself and had a profound influence on his students. It's obvious because this briefcase right here is full of letters that his students wrote to him. I even have props. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's amazing. And, and as uh, you heard, he, he started off his classes with words of wisdom. And I'm gonna read a few of them to you. And, um, okay, and you need to try to guess the, the author because there's going to be a test at the end of this. <laughs> and I, I, picked, I just picked, Cherry picked some of these. These are great. Don't go around saying the world owes you a living. The world owes you nothing. It was here first. <laughs> the second one is do the right thing. It will gratify some and astonish the rest. And another one is, few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. Anybody know who, who, who wrote these? Nope. Okay, I'll, I'll give you the answer. His name was Samuel Longhorn Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain. Yeah, three of them were from Mark Twain. I just, I love Mark Twain, so, uh, except for, yeah. <laughs> Fewer things are hard to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. And Jim was a great example, obviously. Um, he was a positive uh, influence on his students. Uh, he, uh, like I said, there was a bunch of letters that, uh, that, that, that his students wrote to him. And actually, I have some of them here. I'm going to read a couple of them to you. You know, it's like, uh, where is that one? Where are those letters? Oh, here they are. They're kind of, Dave uh, scanned them to me, and so they're kind of written up and down the page, so it might take me a minute or two, but it's, um, it's uh, pretty interesting. This was written um, <laughs> to my dearest curmudgeon. <laughs> this is a student writing to Jim. Hey. Um, using that green pen that we shared, it has been such a great pleasure to be in your presence, a presence of such greatness and near perfection. I feel blessed that I have been enlightened by your, by your service and your s celestial handsomeness. Because <laughs> I, know, I, pro I know that's probably not a word. <laughs> you have become an inspiration to me and I, uh, and I achieve, and I, and I so admire and respect you more than anyone except my dad. You have touched my life and my soul, and, and that has left me uh, with, a, with a new perspective on life. I, th I thank you for, your, for those gifts that you have given me. I will treasure you in my heart forever, Mr. Anglican. And it was uh, Anna... The guy in. That's one. 
I gotta turn the page now and read this other one. <laughs> Without a doubt, you are the best teacher I've ever had. You care about whether we, whether we students know the material or not, and in high school, that means a lot. Too few teachers take extra time with their students, and you are there every day at 7 a.m. like a madman. It must have been that Navy train. They get up early, they have a cup of coffee, you know, it's that, it's that kind of stuff. Now, I'm no, now I'm no, I am no math mind by any stretch, but I feel like I have excelled in my two years with you and, and uh, your extra attention. Math is such a large hurdle for me, and you helped me over it. It was a lot of hard plugging and chugging, but because you cared so much, I did too, and I tried. No more math apathy for me. Anyway, enjoy your retirement. This was just before he retired for the third time. It's too bad future students won't have the honor of being in your class. We are so fortunate to have you uh, for this past two years. Thank you for everything. I mean, I don't know about you. I had some great teachers that impacted my life, but, you know, how many of them write letters like this? You know, it's like, to me, this is just incredible. You know, it, it, it's like, and they called him Mr. E. <laughs> you know, it, it's, I've never witnessed anything like that. Could you imagine having a teacher like this? I mean, it's incredible. I mean, Dave, Dave sifted through and got, you know, got me the, these letters, and he said, yeah, man, this is, a, I, I didn't know about this. This is amazing. And uh, yeah, it is. So um, I want to read another scripture to you. It's in Hebrews chapter 1, and it, it reads that, as this. It says, in the past... God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. He's talking about Jesus. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the, of the majesty in heaven. He, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So it says here that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the re exact representation of his being. You know, what does that mean? Well, if you think about like the moon, where does the moon get its light from? It gets its light from the sun. The sun actually illuminates the moon and we see that radiance, right? And, and so is Jesus. Jesus was the radiance of God's glory. You know, God, you know, made Jesus who he was. Jesus was there from all time. Jesus' life illuminated God. And so, but likewise, think about this. Likewise, we see the radiance of Jim's life in you guys. You know, we heard a lot of these stories. Um, you know, the family members all, you know, just Jim put himself into you guys. And it shows. You know, you guys are amazing. You know, and what an incredible family. I mean, uh, I, I just see it. You know, um, again, the students. I mean, obviously, Jim put himself into his students because, I mean, you, you, kids don't write letters. High school. Kids don't do this kind of thing unless they're, they're impacted. And, 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 he, and he was, you know, Jim impacted people. So, you know, as, as we think through this all, you know, there, this is a time of reflection, honor, yeah, and, and sadness. You know, it's, it's sad. But we have the privilege to honor Jim's life. You know, he, he will be sorely missed. I mean, his folksy wisdom, his love for family, his love for his students, just come, it rings through so clear. And, um, you know, so today, you know, is the time we get to honor Jim and, and, and embrace the family. And uh, I just thank you all. It, this, this is just amazing. And, and, uh, and it's good and right. And, uh, it's pretty awesome, actually. Thanks. 
Kyle. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I feel I should introduce myself. I'm uh, Kyle Jones. I was introduced to this family in 2005, and uh, that was to Heather Jones, <laughs> Dan's son and Jim's granddaughter. <laughs> Dan's daughter and Jim's granddaughter. <laughs> um, <clears throat> a little nervous. I was, uh, I was in the Navy for a while, and uh, through the experience of the Navy, I also was able to interact with Jim on a more informal level. I lived with him for nine months while my wife and I tried to find a place to live so that we could purchase a house here in San Diego. In that time, um, as everyone has, I grew to respect the man that he was. And because of that respect, I felt obligated to read something for him. To stand a watch is not a duty to be taken lightly. A watchstander is charged with protecting the ship by maintaining vigilance while she and her crew are most vulnerable, to protect them from those that would harm by sounding the alarm in case of impending danger. Only when properly relieved may the sailor stay his vigilance and rest his weary body. This charge has endured through the rigor of battle and through the serenity of peace. This duty endures even when the sailor no longer wears the uniform, for his family and his friends become the focus of his protection and vigilance. Today, our Navy has given most of the pomp and circumstance, the honors, traditions, and ceremonies back to history. Time does not give us the freedom to do these things from the past. But we still have to stop all engines, lay about smartly. And drop anchor to pay homage to one of our shipmates going ashore. To honor the years served, the guidance, the leadership, the friendship, and the expertise that this shipmate has freely given at least 61 years. <clears throat> For 24 years in the Navy, this sailor has stood the watch. While some of us were in our beds at night, this sailor stood the watch. In those years when the storm clouds of war were seen brewing on the horizon, <clears throat> this shipmate stood the watch. Many times, he would cast an eye ashore and he would see his family standing there, needing his guidance and help, needing that hand to hold during those hard times, but he still stood the watch. He stood the watch so that we, our families, and our fellow countrymen could sleep soundly in safety each and every night, knowing that a sailor stood the watch. After active service, his duty may have changed for his family and his friends, this sailor stood the watch. For nearly four generations, the youth of his time was in good hands because he stood the watch. Today we are here to say, Shipmate, the watch stands relieved. Relieved by those you have led, those you have guided, and those you have inspired. Lieutenant Commander James Carl Engelkin, you stand relieved. We have the watch. Okay, we're going to uh, close out the service here in just a minute. Um, so I'm, I'm going to bow, uh, let's bow our heads and, and pray. Well, Father, we thank you so much for, uh, 
for this time, God. We, we thank you for the, just the uh, incredible example that Jim gave through his life and his action, Lord. How he, uh, his perseverance, his hard work, his love of family is so clear here, Father. And Father, thank you just being able to be, uh, to honor him, Lord. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing, Father. Lord, we uh, just wish for, the, for comfort for the Anglican family, Father. Please wrap your arms around them at this time, God. This is a very, very hard thing. And uh, Father, you, um, but you are the God of all comfort. And so I pray that you will comfort the Anglican family. Lord, thank you uh, so much to be able to uh, come together like this and honor Jim. We love you. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.